Cyclists have the right to equal access to our public streets and to sufficient and significant road space. In other words, if it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. And so we have the right to use the streets. Cyclists have the right to the full support of educated law enforcement. We've been working hard on partnering with the LAPD. There's a training program now to educate uh, everyone on the rights of cyclists on the streets, and that's important. The full support of a judicial system, and as you mentioned, Bill Rosendahl introduced a motion so that cyclists had a better opportunity to reach out and ask for that support yeah. and then get it. The next one is the, the right to routine accommodations in all roadway projects. That's a federal law. Uh, cyclists have the right to urban and roadway planning, development, and design that enables and supports safe cycling. That's a California state standard yeah. for Caltrans. It's called routine accommodations. If you touch the street, you got to leave it so it works for pedestrians. So Jordan can walk to school for cyclists. So Jordan can ride her bicycle to school. For the LAPD, so they can get out of their cars and ride more bicycles. Yes, that's how it's done. <laughs> so cyclists have the right to traffic signals, signage, and maintenance that enables and supports safe cycling. It doesn't do any good if you can't get across the street. Cyclists have the right to be actively engaged. Here we are, yeah. actively engaged with our partner in the council race. Cyclists have the right... The, the right to full access for themselves and their bicycles on mass transit. Who rode the metro today? Yeah, and that's how it works. Cyclists have the right to end of trip amenities. You mentioned a little water at the end of the ride is such a nice thing. At least. <laughs> but restrooms, a place to lock up the bicycle. It's not too much to ask to be treated like humans, is it? Cyclists have the right to be secure in their persons and property. In other words, we, we have the right to be free of having our stuff seized because we locked up our bike to a light pole. And often that's um, uh, the result of not having good bicycle facilities. And cyclists have the right to peaceably assemble in the public space. And this is in response to the fact that whenever you saw two or more cyclists in a gathered, there was a time when people would yell, break it up, break it up, because it was a scary thing. But look how great it looks. So that's the cyclist bill of rights. In essence, these are already standards, codes, rules, policies, and law. Well, I, I would like to add one yeah. more to it. Sure. Um, and maybe in, you, you don't you have the time it right to write it. There. But I believe, especially for my district, that you should have a right to an affordable bicycle. You can have the, bi the, the bill of rights if you don't have a bicycle and you want one. I think we should be able to provide some of that because that's a public usage. And if it increases or decreases our carbon footprint, it should be a, a public right, I believe. So I want to add that to that, and I believe I agree with all of them. Amen. <laughs> All right, so uh, one more question. Standing behind us is uh, Jose Segala. He's the uh, president of the Greater Echo Park Elysian Neighborhood Council. Mm -hmm. And we have lots of... Is that? Oh, sorry. sorry, I was talking into the... Sorry, I was talking... <laughs> Jose Segal is the president of the uh, Greater Echo Park Elysian Neighborhood Council. Kevin's here from Reseda. Glenn's here from Encino. Dorothy's here from the Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Coalition. There's lots of neighborhood council. Mar Vista's represented over here. There's lots of neighborhood council folks here. How is it that you plan to work with the neighborhood councils on making Council District 15 work? Yeah. Well, one of the things is... I was working with the neighborhood councils um, as a field deputy before I was the legislative and policy deputy. What I believe is, and it's not it's not a mystery that some of the council members may not support the power of a neighborhood council, but our democracy is proven to be correct every single time, not only you vote, but every time you are able to assemble in a neighborhood council. So the, all of our neighborhood councils have a champion in me. They have some of the ideas that are the closest to the ground. They have some of the, the most innovative, but what we have to understand is these are volunteers. So the least a council member can do 
is provide them the support, the tools, and the empowerment necessary to make sure that they can accomplish their dreams and desires that are that are given birth from the community. So again, the neighborhood councils are strong, but we need to make sure we give them the tools necessary to make them even stronger. So one of the things that I wanted to provide is that every time a neighborhood council provided food at a meeting, they had an uh, uh, influx of participants. When they don't have any foods, because a lot of their meetings are at the time of dinner, you see like two or three people in the audience. So one of the things is, is that we want to do a public-private partnership where we work with the neighborhood councils and local businesses and restaurants where we're able to at least provide some type of snack. You know, I'm going to be a king on snacks and water, at least at these events, so that when they do come to voice their democratic right of whatever that is that they feel or have a problem or issue with, that they have something to eat there. And again, this is a this is many-fold because, again, you, it's very hard to be passionate about an issue when your stomach is grumbling. When you're over here unemployed and you're trying to figure out how you're going to feed your children, doesn't mean that your concerns are any less than the person who may have a job. So that's one of the things that I've committed to my neighborhood councils. And when I was the field deputy, I went to about 20 to 25 meetings every day. I mean, every month. We went to the neighborhood council meetings, the neighborhood watch meetings. We went to the homeowners association meetings. We have to understand that our democracy is proven to be right every time a neighborhood council assemble. In, in addition, I know I can talk a lot, but I just have to say this. If neighborhood councils want to host and save the city money by hosting their own and managing their own elections, then they have that right. All right. So, uh, Justin, in uh, the next episode of uh, This Is Your Life, I'd like to bring some <laughs> special guests up here on stage. Uh, your partners in the upcoming election. Well, this is my campaign manager. All my right. Daughter, Jordan. <laughs> and my beautiful wife, Misha. And we got one more on the way. All right. So God is good. So we just wanted to say thank you very much uh, for stepping up. Yeah. And for running. And for joining us today. And we've got one month to work together. And there's, we decided there's three things you can do. The first thing you can do is you can vote. So if you live in Council District 15, you can vote. The second thing is you can contribute. Yes. You know, every time I do this, I think of one more thing you can do. Actually, I guess there's four things. Okay, you can vote. You can contribute. You can vote and contribute. But you can also work. You can make phone calls. You can walk. You can talk. But it's important that we talk. And right now on the other side of City Hall, they're talking about what's going on. On the streets here, look, people are moving at a nice slow speed so they can talk about what's important. And with the council race that's coming up, it's our opportunity to make sure the issues are yeah. on the table yep. and that we're talking about what's important. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the Brimmer family standing here with Justin Brimmer, candidate for Council District 15. The special election is one month away. I'm going to say one last thing. Yes, sir. One of the things that I said about to our community and to our residents and, and to any different um, organization or groups that unite underneath a common cause, you deserve a champion in City Hall. We cannot afford people to get in these positions and turn a deaf ear to the needs and the requirements and the deserving rights that we have as a community. So when you look at this race, I want you to see yourself. When you look at this race, I want you to go ahead and visit my website, text me your ideas, because this is a new day. And when November 8th comes around, it's an opportunity whether you live in our district or not. Our vote affects all of City of Los Angeles. So it matters that you want to ask those questions. What do you think about this? And what do you think about that? But at the end of the day, what we are going up against at many times are people who believe they got their ideas separate and independent of the very people who voted them into those positions. So what I commit to you is that I will not cause another special election that costs $1.5 million that all of the city of Los Angeles has to pay. That when I commit, I commit the same way I committed to my beautiful wife and to my child, that I will be there for the long haul. You cannot keep going and going to the next um, level of government just because it's convenient. You were voted in by the people of City 15 and City 
fit, fitting can count on me to be their champion in City Hall and all of Los Angeles can understand if you come to my desk, text me your concern or Facebook me something that you are passionate about that you will have an open ear and a listening um, champion who's going to make sure the legislation gets pushed and moved on our behalf. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your future support, your future donation. But most of all, I thank you for your prayers. All right. Thank you very much.